So, hi everyone. Welcome to the first talk of the 2024 invited seminar series organized by IEEE Computer Society San Diego chapter. And we are delighted to host Dr. Aryan Kavir, co-founder and CEO of Graymatter Robotics, as our first speaker of this year's series. Uh, this talk is co-hosted by IEEE Robotic and Automation Society chapter San Diego section, IEEE Signal Processing Society chapters of San Diego section, IEEE Computer Society chapters of Pikes Peak, Boise, Hawaii, and Foothill sections, IEEE RAS and Signal Processing Society of Boise section, uh, IEEE RAS of San Fernando Valley section. And we have uh, Open Research Institute as our media partner partner for this entire series. Uh, so most of our talks are recorded and uploaded to a YouTube channel uh, maintained by ORI for later viewing. Uh, with that, I'll hand over the floor to our vice chair, Dr. Peter Koram Shahi, to introduce today's speaker. Uh, thank you, Paul, and hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we are excited to kick off our 2024 invited seminar series and today as our first guest uh, we are pleased to have dr Ariane kabir uh, to give us a talk on driving manufacturing innovation with ai powered smart robotic cells uh, dr kabir is a co-founder and the ceo of gray matter robotics which is one of the fastest growing ai robotics companies disrupting manufacturing industry Dr. Kabir and his team are building solutions to help manufacturers improve shop floor workers' quality of life, increase product capacity, and reduce costs. Ariane is an entrepreneur and a problem solver with background in robotics and artificial intelligence. During his PhD, Dr. Kabir built smart uh, robotic assistants while developing planning and learning algorithms for high degree of freedom systems. Aryan has multiple patents and has published several research articles in prestigious forums. Dr. Kabri's work has received global recognition, including uh, awards from National Science Foundation and Robotics Business for Review. Additionally, his work has been featured at the main stage of Web Summit and by the Society of Manufacturing Engineers. With that introduction, Dr. Kabir, the floor is yours. Please take it away. Thank you very much, Rupal. Thank you very much, Piraz, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, everyone, and nice to meet you all. Um, so let me actually share my screen, and I'd love to tell you about what we are doing at Grimata Robotics, and I'd also love to give you a little bit of a preamble on manufacturing today. By the way, how many how many of you are familiar with manufacturing? I don't know if there's a way to you know interact or towards the end that will be Q and A. I guess right. Yeah, we'll have Q and A towards the end, or if you prefer in in the middle, uh, that's fine. Got it. Got it. Okay, okay. sounds great. So I'm gonna share my screen. I guess you're already able to see my screen now. So manufacturing you know is very vast and very wide and there are many different you know uh many different industries that we know around us we know about automotive industries we know about aerospace industries we know about garments and clothing manufacturing now the reality is that today in the us there is a big big challenge in manufacturing now i'm pretty sure that some of you might be familiar with this kind of news headlines. There are significant shortage of skilled labor. As of today in the US, there are 250,000 open jobs in manufacturing that are remaining unfilled. And if we don't solve those problems, the challenges of labor shortage within the next you know, seven years, the US economy will be at a risk of a trillion dollar every single year by 2030. There's not enough people to do these jobs anymore because these are extremely tedious and extremely challenging. On the other hand, we know that automotive factories, the Toyota, Tesla, Fords, and GMs of the world, they have been using robots for decades. They have been successfully using robots in production. They manually program the robots. They you know, spend months to program them. Then they let them lose in production. And these hard-coded robots, they repeat the same movement, same action again and again and again and it works out beautifully because you have hundreds of thousands of identical parts but the hard reality of manufacturing is that outside of automotive and outside of electronics 
the vast 90% of manufacturing are high mix, high variability production by nature. What I mean by that is that in the most, the 90% of manufacturing, if you go to the floor, you will see there are part to part variations. There are skew variations due to the material physics and the process physics in the upstream. Even though some parts look the same in human eye within the same skew, if you take measurements, if you take inspections, you'll find few millimeter to few centimeter variation from part to part. As a result, what happens is that you can't have you know, pre-programmed robots repeating the same motion. If they were gonna try to do that blindly, they're not gonna make contact with certain parts. They're gonna plow through certain parts and damage them. And then sometimes they might get lucky. As a result, there's only about 9,000 robots in the US doing surface finishing and treatment applications. And more than 1.5 million people are doing these jobs by hand every single day. And this happens anywhere every, and everywhere around us. Let it be consumer products, musical instruments, sporting goods like football helmets, surfboards, you name it. The, you know, our household interior products such as countertops, sinks, bathtubs, these are all being done by people by hand. These people, they're spending every day of their lives, 10 to 12 hours doing this job manually. And sometimes they don't even wear any protective equipment and they're breathing in the dust and they start having carpal tunnel, shoulder injury, back injury, respiratory problems and whatnot within three to five years of doing these jobs. And this is not just true for smaller objects, any large non-automotive parts, let it be buses, trains, trucks, RVs, delivery vans, fire trucks, ambulances, you name it. The entire marine segment, the boats, the yachts, the submarines, aircraft carriers, the ships, the entire aerospace segment, commercial aviation, defense articles, next generation space transportation, next generation EVTOLs, the entire energy sector, let it be renewable energy, let it be traditional oil and gas, let it be you know, nuclear energy. All of these are done by manual labor day in, day out. And the, and the reality is that there are more than 1.5 million people doing this job in the US and you know, globally, the number is significantly higher. Globally, the surface finishing and treatment market is a massive more than half a trillion dollar market by the labor wage annually. Across the globe, the manufacturers, they have tremendous shortage of skilled labor for this segment of applications. They have 60 to 75% labor churn. The boomers are retiring. The Gen X will start retiring soon. The younger generation, people like us, no one is taking up this, these jobs. The younger generation, they prefer gig jobs. You know, you find a better quality of life in even delivering food or driving Uber, as opposed to spending 10, 12 hours every day of your lives in this kind of dirty, dangerous, dull environment. Now, what we're doing at Grey Matter is that we are solving this problem by creating autonomous solutions. We are creating, creating autonomous industrial robots and systems that can help this well, it used to be a lot cheaper for the the dough. Uh, I'm sorry, was there a question? Uh, hi, Gordon, can you repeat, please? All right, if not, I can continue. So the way we're solving the problem is by combining our proprietary physics in from AI technologies with commercially available robot sensors and tools, the robot sensors and tools that have been perfected over the decades. The limitation was that, you know, you needed someone to program them. And once, once you program them, they would repeat the same program, but they cannot adapt to variations and variabilities. And we're changing that. At the core, we make physics in from AI technologies that combines the data-driven approach with the physics models, and then creates a solution where we can deliver a safe robotic cell in a, a very safe and efficient cyber physical system for mission critical operations such as manufacturing. On top of that, we also combine our process knowledge and expertise of the process physics, because end of the day, these applications, they have to, we have to produce the right quality. It's not just about moving boxes or parcels from one place to the other. When it comes to applications such as sanding, polishing, buffing, grinding, painting, coating, you have to produce the right quality. There's a lot of process physics involved. And these operators who have been doing these jobs for decades, 
it takes them four to six months of training to become really good at these jobs. And now we are converting that artisan approach into science-based approach and encoding that into our physics and from AI with our technologies. And on top of that, for any of these high mix, high variability production environment to successfully adopt robotic solution, we also need advanced prognostics and health monitoring to be able to support them and guarantee uptime. We have systems all over North America and we have 95 to 99% uptime across all of these systems and solutions. And we are working with a large number of manufacturers across different industries, aerospace, defense, specialty vehicles, marine, general manufacturing and recreation, and working on a wide range of materials, producing the quality that all these manufacturers need. Now, let me show you with, with a quick video at a high level, how does the solution work? You can bring any part in front of our robots. We do not even need any CAD model to work out of. You can press a, place a part, press a button on the screen. It's as simple as using a microwave oven. You put some food in there, you press a couple of buttons, you walk away, you come back, your food is ready. It's a similar approach. We designed this solution for shop floor workers and operators who has no knowledge of robotics, no knowledge of automation, no knowledge of engineering. You bring a part, you do not need CAD model, you press a button, the robot starts by scanning the part, figuring out the geometry on the fly, and it automatically determines all the different geometrical features throughout the surface. And it figures out how it have to apply a different force, different RPM, different contact, different compliance, different interface and backup pads and sandpapers to be able to produce a consistent quality at each of those geometric features. At the same time, we have to avoid all unwanted contacts and collisions. We have to make sure the cables and hoses, they're not getting entangled uh, during the process and maintain a continuous operation. At every, there are millions of points throughout the whole surface. In peak and place operation, you have two endpoint constraints. It's primarily a perception problem. But when it comes to surface finishing and treatment applications, you have millions of points throughout the whole surface. At every point, there are dozens of constraints and you have to solve them. And it's a computationally nightmarish problem. And we solve for that under a minute in a few seconds using our physics in front of AI technologies. Now, you know, depending on the applications, you may need uh, you know, one robot or multiple robots, depending on how fast do you need to produce these parts. And in those scenarios, we often have multiple robots working together and the same technology, same software is able to identify how multiple agents should be working with each other, dividing and distributing the task and basically making sure it's a safe operation and there is no collision between the systems, between the robots, and we are able to operate safely uh, in a high mix environment where any part can be a completely new part every single time. And there are you know, many layers to the technology for solving this. The four major layers are perception problems, the autonomy problem, how you know the perception problems are how do you you know, how do you understand what is the part versus the environment? How do you figure out how to work on it? under different lighting conditions for different materials in these different environments? How do you work and adapt to the different sensors to be able to you know, get a very accurate uh, data and point cloud for a small part versus a very large part without taking too much compute time for the very large part? How do you solve all these problems under a minute? We have an autonomy layer where we are figuring out how the tools should move over the surface, how the robot should be moving the tools, how multiple robots should be working together and solving those millions of constraints in a few seconds. We have a layer of learning process physics and process model to identify what kind of process parameters can produce the right quality for different materials. Let it be aluminum, let it be composites, let it be acrylic, let it be wooden surface, let it be solid surface, let it be different coated and painted material. And then we also have another layer of advanced prognostics and health monitoring uh, to be able to predictively estimate when something can go wrong and enable the robot to prevent those mistakes from happening and continue a safe operation. And for these customers, they get the benefits of two to four times increase in productivity. Uh, in one of the, the last video that I was showing in the composite fiberglass parts, two of those parts used to take about an hour for a person to sand by hand now the same person, they can push through eight parts in an hour 
through the robotic cell. That's four times productivity gain. On top of that, we're seeing the benefits of saving a lot of consumables for all these manufacturers because we are not only using the technology to create autonomous robots for these operations, but also optimizing the resources for the manufacturers. Invariably, we are helping manufacturers to save 30 to 70% of consumables. The sandpaper, the paint chemicals, and the media that you use in production, there, there are a lot of waste in the manual operation. And again, I do not blame the humans. We all get tired when doing the job and we want to put on a fresh sandpaper so that we can get the maximum efficiency. However, for the robot, we can continuously adapt the recipe throughout the process and produce the consistent quality by adapting other variables on the fly, depending on the material physics. And that enables us to save 30 to 70% consumables for anywhere from a football helmet maker to a submarine maker or a fighter jet maker. And once you start doing that, that's a massive contribution towards environmental sustainability because you're also eliminating rework, repair, and scrap. The other big component here is that you can bring in any shape or sizes of parts in front of the system and we can work on them seamlessly. For example, in this, in this scenario, it's a bathtub and the robot has to polish both the interior and exterior surface of the bathtub. And it's automatically programming itself to avoid all collision and it's adapting on the fly to make sure that none of the components are getting any scratch and it can actually work both inside the tub as well as on the exterior, just like a human would have done that. And it's a computationally nightmarish problem and a lot of work goes behind the scene to be able to solve some of these problems. And again, you cannot completely rely on a data-driven approach because you know you can't extrapolate in a complete you know uh, and and risk the the safety of the parts of the robots or people around the robot. So we are leveraging a lot of data-driven approach, but then we are leveraging known physics because end of the day, these cyber-physical systems are staying in the realm of physics to be able to you know complete these operations. The other thing we do is that as part of our prognostics and health monitoring, we can also estimate the life of the tool or life of the abrasive media or other, other tools for different applications. And based on that, we are, as I was mentioning earlier, we can identify how the robot can adapt its process parameters to produce consistent quality throughout the process and help manufacturers save 30 to 70% of the consumables. I'd like to go over a couple of specific use case and example. You know, in, in many materials, let it be aluminum or let it be transparent acrylics, if you simply take a sanding head and go back and forth on the surface, you will produce a non-uniform finish like the top left picture where you can see the grid lines. Also for the transparent acrylic, if you look at the bottom left picture, you'll see there are waviness when you're looking at a checkerboard throughout that transparent surface. Now, this transparent material could be the cockpit, the canopy of a fighter jet, right? And if you have that kind of defects and waviness, the pilot is gonna be in a situation to make some bad decisions. It needs to be like the bottom right picture where you have full transparency. And for, for a robot, if a robot simply took us back and forth operation throughout the surface, it will produce lines and it will produce waviness. Now, the question is, how do we remove material from the surface in a uniform fashion and produce a uniform surface quality, just like the middle pictures on the aluminum or on the bottom right on the acrylic? And what it takes is taking a vertically integrated full stack approach, not just the AI technologies to make robots autonomous, but also taking a full stack approach to identify the right sensing technology, the right material interaction between the, between the part and the abrasive, going up to the extent of creating new interface and backup pads so that overall the system is optimized and you can guarantee a safe solution. You can guarantee a solution that will produce the right quality every single time. And one interesting fact is that these, these you know, canopies, the fighter jet canopies, Finally, they get inspected by a, by a fighter jet pilot. They come in, they sit inside the canopy, they look directly to the, to the sky and identify whether there is any waviness or not. Instead of a fighter jet coming in to do the inspection, we can also have a robot do the inspection. Even for this transparent part, we had to develop a completely new sensing mechanism 
that can identify scratches or defects on transparent surfaces. And not just for transparent parts or complex, uh, you know, surface characteristic, even for certain application where you may need dimensional accuracy, where you have to remove a different amount of material from different spots to produce the right quality. We leverage different uh, metrology operations and combine that with our uh, physics and run AI to produce the right material removal rate and figure out how can you remove a very specific amount of material from a targeted area to bring the sample, to bring the part to the, into the tolerance. In this particular example, I'm gonna fast forward. As you'll see, there is a progressive step-by-step -step operation to take the part, identify all the high spots and remove them and get it into the tolerance of that you know, green area that you're seeing at the end. And this has applications in defense, in energy, in uh, nuclear reactors and whatnot. And many other occasions, you also have to produce the right quality and quality means you, your surface needs to have the right gloss, your surface have to have the right roughness or some of the other application. In those scenarios, again, we're leveraging different sensing technologies and we're creating a complete feedback loop to have the robot to be able to produce the right quality every single time and take out any subjectivity from human inspection. But the bottom line is that, you know, we, we design these solutions for the shoppler operators, the operators who can simply place a part, press a button to be able to do these jobs seamlessly. Often you may want certain features that the robot should avoid and work around, and we can train the models to be able to detect those features automatically. These are some examples of, you know, silicon wafer plate, uh, the plates for, you know, manufacturing silicon wafers. And you, the, pegs, the vertical pegs that are installed on this plate, you have to work around them and you cannot scratch them and make a dent. And the system can be trained to work around them and only you know, focus on the area uh, and not send those specific features. On the other hand, in the same environment, you can throw in another, another plate without any of those geometric features and it can now work on the entire surface. So the adaptability is the, is the key to make these robots available to be used in high mix high variability manufacturing environment. It can be very high volume operation. It can be very low volume operations. We have customers who are making 1.4 million parts a year. We have customers who are making only 100 parts a year, but very large surface area. And, you know, in many cases, you may also have part features that can look like you know, similar to other part areas. So I'm, I'm gonna pause on this video and highlight something. So the, so the mark, like this person who is applying the markers, right? They are highlighting a weld line. They're very fine weld line. You can also see in the back with this slightly, you know, uh, you know, opting area. They look very similar to the bend lines of this, you know, bended sheet metal part. But the robot, if you took a completely vision-based approach or, you know, uh, perception-based approach, it may look confusing which, which areas or which targets are the bend lines versus which targets are the weld, very fine weld lines. Now, to guide the system, to guide the robot, instead of having the operator to mark certain things on the point cloud or getting confused by CAD models, we created a very simple user interface where the operators, the shop floor guy, they can take a simple marker and highlight certain areas to guide the robot that, hey, focus your attention on this targets as opposed to the full surface. Now the challenge here becomes how do you scale that across different lighting condition, across different substrate, across different robots and across different sensors to have a uniform solution. And that's where a lot of the training uh, gets goes behind the scene. Another simple example of you know creating very simple user interface for the operators is that sometimes you may want to work on certain targeted area and avoid some of this other area completely. In this example, what the operator is doing, they're simply masking out certain target shapes, putting a cross, telling, that tells the robot, avoid this area and work on the other uh, surfaces that does not have the, the other segments on the surface that does not have the cross in it. So, you know, you can have island inside of an island as well to let the robot know that, okay, you have to focus here and avoid everything else. Our goal, 
And again, end of the day, for all these applications to be successful across all these different industries, anywhere from a football helmet maker to a fighter jet maker, we need a very simple solution for the operators who can run these systems in a daily operation day to day. We, you do not need an engineer to run this robots to run the systems. End of the day, what we're creating for all these applications is that we are creating a smart robotic cell, a smart assistant for all these operators in the production floor who can now become, you know, become a robot operator. Now, one thing we hear often after installing our systems and installing our robots is that these operators who were previously, you know, manual sanding technicians or painting technician, they tell us that they can now go back home, play with their kids, their body doesn't hurt anymore. And more importantly, the solutions that we're developing for all these different industries, they are helping us to impact millions of lives across manufacturing, across all these segments, helping us to also build the backbone of economy. Because if you stop manufacturing parts, you cannot sell them, you cannot run services with them, you cannot you know, run advertise for them. There is a cascading catastrophic effect on the economy. And we are also contributing with this advanced technology, we are also contributing towards environmental sustainability because we are helping manufacturers save 30 to 70% of the consumables and eliminate repair and rework. And finally, there are a lot of articles that are of the national interest that you cannot manufacture without this technology. You cannot afford to outsource them, outsource them to a different country. They have to be manufactured near shore or onshore. And with the advent of all these advanced technologies, we're able to solve these problems and make a big impact for all these manufacturers. Now, with that, I'd love to take a pause and see if there are any questions. Uh, there's a few other technical slides that I can get into to you know, explain how the technology works, but would love to take a pause and see if there are any questions. Uh, I see a question in the chat from Jean. Uh, do you know what is the state of the art for robotics to assist with the grinding of precision optics, like large scale, large telescope mirrors? Is that available today? That's a very good question. I do not know. I'm going to make sure that our team identifies who are making those telescope, telescope mirrors and then reaches out to them. Um, no, to be honest, I do not know uh, how those telescope mirrors are getting finished. We, we have been reached out by certain other optical sensor manufacturers who would like to use robotics for certain finishing. Um, who has the operations being done manually by hand, but for, for those larger mirrors, I do not know whether they're already being done by robots or not. Can this... Um... So, so in the videos, I see that these robots have uh, this sanding heads. Are there like different sanding heads available? Can it pick and choose? Correct. Uh, depending on like which area to reach. Correct. Exactly. So we are we are, you know, uh, not. I would say we are limited by what's available in the market for tooling for robots, but you know, you can use, choose between one inch, three inch, five inch, eight inch, 12 inch, or even some uh, very small tool heads, which are more like Dremel, depending on the application. So the approach we take is that looking at an application, identifying the right uh, hardware configuration to be able to solve that problem. But the software stack, the AI layer, that remains agnostic to the hardware can automatically uh, program the robots on the fly and have autonomous uh, operation. In, in so, that, it, in I mean, my question is, can it say, say you analyze the surface and then you pick something, then mm -hmm. does it change ahead once it has done a certain part and then moves to some other part? Yes, in certain certain applications it does. For example, let's, say, let's take this guitar as an example. The mm -hmm. five-inch tool head, it can only work on the larger flat area of the guitar. And then, so the guitar solution that we have, I don't have the video here. It's a five robot in sequence, two of the robot with a five inch head, two of the robot with a three inch head and one robot with a drum sander. So the five inch heads, they work on the larger flat surfaces. The three inch head, they work on the you know carved areas on the edges and on the side carved area. And the drum sander that can go inside the horn area, which is a very tight space for 
a five inch or three inch tool to reach. And those, you know, in the conveyor belt, as in when we're scanning a guitar, those, you know, decisions are being generated automatically and then passed along to the right robot uh, with the right tool head to, you know, focus on that specific geometric segment. I see. Uh, I see a comment or question from Ryan. Uh, this is a game changing AI, especially for the manual labor sector. Gray matter robotics is onto something huge. Can you go in, go more into the robotic cell? Is the cell one unit itself or multiple units that make up the cell? Yeah, no, it can be, it can be both. It can be one unit. It can be multiple units. Often what we do is that, you know, it can be one robot working on one side, one robot working both sides, multiple robots working together uh, in a in a cell. So it can be it can be all of you know any configuration. But typically in production, what we do is you know one robot in a cell or two robots in a cell. Um, that those are the typical configurations. Sometimes you know in a couple of case, special cases we have gone up to you know let's say five robots in a cell especially let's say the guitar example I was giving, it, it's something like this on the screen where different robots have a different tool and you have to run a very high speed operation and complete each of these guitars in under three minutes. And um, Dr. Kavir, I do have a question. So uh, the planning of this sanding head is being is being conducted right on the fly. So depending on the geometry of the object, it decides where to start and what's the route that it needs to take? Correct. It's an, it's an online operation. Uh, the compute happens on the edge because you can't really, you know, uh, have any lag in the process because in a manufacturing environment, every second you can save uh, counts basically. So it happens on the fly and the, the, the purpose of this technology is to be able to address the high mix, high variability operation. So even when you have, let's say, a million parts coming through the line, each part can be slightly different. So directly from the live scan data, the robot autonomously programs itself to be able to adapt to the variations and variabilities from instance to instance. Oh, I see. So it doesn't need to first, uh, so when it comes to, a, let's say, a huge object, it doesn't need to first make that model and then decide. No. So it start it's live okay. yeah if it's a if it's a complete it's if it's a very complex geometry that you know this robot is seeing for the first time the compute time might be slightly longer instead of a few seconds it might be a minute or minute and a half but then next time it's going to be again significantly quicker under 10 seconds mm -hmm. it's very cool thank you what sort of sensor are used for the analyzing an object yeah, so um, it's a combination. So primarily different optical sensors. So there are, you know, a sensor suite to be able to understand the 3D shape of the object. Then we have sensor suite to be able to understand the, you know, surface characteristic, either surface roughness or surface gloss. In certain application, we need to uh, measure the hardness of the material. Then it becomes a different sensor, which is more contact based. And then in cert certain applications, especially for aerospace or nuclear, we need to be able to measure dimensional accuracy under 40 microns, 25 microns in that realm. So then there are specialized optical sensors to be able to do that. So depending on the application, it's a, it's a range of uh, sensor suite that's suitable for each application. I see. Uh, there is another question. You talked about the workers, like the robot operators. How do you train these human yeah. operators? Yeah. yeah, great, great question. So that's the that's the whole motivation behind, you know, uh, we do what we do, basically. Being able to train an operator who has no knowledge of robotics or, to, or automation or manufacturing very quickly. So we, we go to the shop floor, basically, and, you know, Within half a day, uh, I'm not sure if you're still able to see our screen or not, but within half a day, these operators get trained. It's a very intuitive, extremely simple user interface where the operators can simply decide, okay, um, if I place this part here, then I just press a single button, scan and send. If I have a few different materials uh, to choose from, then I can just select the material from a drop down menu and then hit scan and send. And then rest of the operation is autonomous. It's really as simple as, you know, operating a 
an iPhone or a microwave oven? Uh, what's the there's another question from Daniel Peters. Uh, what uh, IO? What is the range of pricing for the exact robotic cell shown in slide twenty? <laughs> what drives the variability in the price? Yeah, I I can't. I will not be sharing the price in this forum. <laughs> I'll be very happy to answer that question. Please feel free to send me an email. Uh, or, or to our team, our sales team will be very happy to answer the not, you know details of the number. But I can I can tell more about you know how we offer the solution. So we offer the solution as a service to our customers. So just like hiring a person, you can hire a robot just like a digital worker. And our customers sign up for multi-year contract. They pay us a flat monthly fee or a flat annual fee for the full turnkey solution. And it's an OPEX to OPEX comparison. So in a manufacturing setting, you, you have your workers wage, you have your workers comp, which is again, another big component for the manufacturers, the workers injury and associated workers comp. Then you have hiring, training and retention costs that goes, becomes really high, especially when you have 60 to 75% labor churn. Then there are costs associated with consumables that we can save 30 to 70%. So we look at all this, when you look at all these different operational expenses, and then you look at the cost of hiring a robot, you, the, the manufacturers, they start seeing ROI from day one. Now, in terms of the variability on the price, it depends on the, you know, the, the feature set that you're getting from the system, the application and how much value creation uh, is happening in the, in the actual manufacturing process. Any other question from the audience? The, I, think, I think the other thing I'd like to highlight, which I, I did not highlight at the beginning, is that for all these robots to operate, right, seamlessly, um, things, things will always go wrong, right, end of the day. They're, you know, these are end of the day machines and something or the other will always go wrong. Now we have 95 to 99% uptime across our system. And when something goes wrong, 97% of the issues we're able to resolve under five minutes due to our prognostics, health monitoring, and remote support capabilities. There are certain issues that you know, the robot can detect on its own and autonomously recover that. For example, the examples you're seeing on the left, the robot detects certain issue, automatically recovers, puts the green checkbox, resumes operation. And then there are certain issues where the you know, operator may need guidance and we may need the operator's help to resolve that. In those scenarios, the operators, the software workers, they can simply send text message to, to our remote support engineers and they can jump in, they can give them instruction and then the operators can resume the operation. So combination of the autonomous recovery and quick recovery with the help of remote support especially for this domain, for the operators in manufacturing who often may not even speak English, that's a, that's a big factor that enabled us to, you know, push out and push out all these robots and make an impact. Uh, there's a question on the bridge from Tasia. Uh, how about how long has this technology been in development and what are possible goals improvements for the future? Right. Um, we, as a company, we have been around for about four years. So we started the gray matter in March of 2020. So we will be four years old next month. Um, and then we have quite a lot of patented technologies within gray matter. Uh, we have a lot of technologies that we are not patenting, which are more, you know, uh, core trade secrets that we're keeping. And the, the improvements are happening on a daily basis. As we're learning from all these, you know, dozens of robots, tens of robots in the field, the systems and the models are improving. At the same time, we are learning sometimes the certain limitation of certain architecture or certain, you know, uh, design of models that we have to now improve as we are scaling. So I would say, you know, there are a few different dimensions in which we are making improvements in, and advancements in our technology. One dimension is the fundamental technology improvement in all throughout the whole tech stack, improvement of all the algorithms. 
at the same time, improvement of different hardware components and how everything comes together. The second dimensions of progress is across different applications. Some of the applications that we demonstrated today are just the beginning and we are expanding our roadmap as our customers are requesting us for more and more applications to be able to capture the the end-to-end -end process within manufacturing. And the third dimension of progress that we're making are often in the in the section of platform. For example, all the different applications that you have seen so far, they are robots on rail or stationary robots. In many cases, we need you know uh, mobile systems. So at the moment, we are developing mobile systems to be able to work on really massive parts, large boat hulls, large submarines, hundred you know meter long wind turbine blades. So that's another uh, dimension of uh, development that we are that we are doing. Um, uh, a question from Daniel: uh, Is gray matter matter in startup mode? That means selling to a small number of inventor customers or selling to tens, hundreds, and thousands of customers yearly. We are a startup. We are growing extremely fast. I would say we are the fastest growing robotics startup. We are selling to customers who are Fortune 100 companies, Fortune 50 companies. At the same time, we are selling to customers who, you know, let's say a medium sized business. But I would say the vast majority of our customers are publicly traded companies. Uh, can you talk about one off and or repair scenarios as opposed to production or manufacturing? Sure. So one example would be, let's say automotive aftermarket, let's say automotive body shop or the car repair shop, right? Over there, if you, if you, if you are repairing the body of the car, that's more of a one off operation as opposed to production uh, in manufacturing. But the, the beauty of our technology is that it's designed for high mix, high variability, and we are treating every instance as a completely new instance. And we do not depend or rely on a fixed program. And we're adapting on the fly to the instance that has been presented. So the technology is equally applicable to, you know, manufacturing new parts, as well as maintenance and repair operation. And the maintenance oper and repair operations operations are pretty massive. Any any vehicle gets made once, let's say any aircraft gets built once, but they go through refinishing operation every couple of years. So what's the like longevity of your robots? Any any? Yeah. <laughs> They are uh, the, you know, these robots, they last for 12 to 15 years uh, in production environments. However, the, the sensors and the tooling, we would, you know, what we do is that we upgrade them more frequently because those technologies are advancing at a much rapid pace. I see. And I do see uh, uh, this this deck is actually quite interesting. This physics informed AI, and uh, I was going to actually ask you about anomaly detection. Uh, so is this like, do you have like your own data set, and is like what sort of technology is behind uh, right. uh, these? Yeah, yeah. So um, the data set piece is very. Interesting because you know again in a in a in a traditional learning environment you can have access to millions of data points but in manufacturing it's it's very expensive to get, gather the data because now you have to run experiments on millions of parts which becomes cost prohibitive so one of the one of the novelty or one of the core technology that we have is a learning mechanism where we can facilitate the learning in a data scarce environment instead of learning the full space we can very quickly identify which region of the space, the optimum LI, and run experiments in that area and within 20 to 30 iterations converge very quick so that we can identify the right uh, parameters just on a couple of sample parts, basically. And when it comes to physics informed technologies, right, physics informed AI technologies, there are different flavors of that. And for in our, in our full stack solution for the different application or use cases, we use the different flavors of physics and from AI. In certain certain scenarios, you are, you know, you, you are building models with specialized architecture that can capture different, you know, physics models. 
in certain scenarios, you are building uh, just in, you know incorporating the physics constraints into the models, and in some time, certain scenarios, you're taking the physics model as a baseline, right, and then updating based on the data that you're gathering in the in the manufacturing process itself or in the production settings. And sometimes, in many scenarios, we can't afford to run experiments, and we we have to rely on synthetic data and using certain generative uh, technologies to generate the synthetic data to train the system on. So it's a combination of all the different, uh, all the four flavors applied to this different application segment within the full stack. Yeah, quite impressive, nice. Uh, any other question from the audience? Uh, feel free to unmute and you can also ask like uh, directly interact. I had a question. Uh, how long has your company been in existence? We are, we will be four years old next month. And, and um, what, what's the size of your engineering team roughly? As of today, we're about 64 people. Okay. Thank you. Right. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, that uh, I, I think uh, the, I, I didn't hear any more questions from the audience. So, uh, so I'd like to uh, thank Aryan. Thank you so much uh, for the nice talk, and it's very interesting to see uh, to to learn about the, the technology that you are developing at Gray Matter Robotics. Uh, uh, and uh, thanks a lot for talk, talking uh, in our forum. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure to be here and uh, speak to speak to the group in San Diego. Uh, we are located in LA. Uh, we are 20 minutes from LAX. Uh, we're in Gardena, 10 minutes from SpaceX. So if anyone is interested to learn more about what we're doing and would love to you know, get a tour or play with robots, Please feel free to reach out. I'll be very happy to host. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, Daniel asked for contact info. Uh, yeah, I think Aryan is available on LinkedIn, and yes. you can uh, uh, reach out to him. Yeah, great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, yeah, please, uh, if you have uh, further questions, feel free to send them uh, to me or, or directly contact Arian. Thanks. Right. Yeah, bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Do you mind if we get your email for contacting? Because, um, yeah, definitely going to contact. Um, okay, yeah. Give me.